the third week of uh, our series called What If, where we've been looking at a number of the passages, one and some, and several in succession out of the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, he begins by saying, you have heard it said, but, but here's what I'm going to say to you now. So maybe you were taught this or tradition or a combining of some of the Old Testament teachings say this or a direct commandment even says this, but I want to get to the heart of what that commandment and that teaching is really all about. And as we examine some of those teachings, we've had to ask the question, what if Jesus was serious? Guys in the back, the, the clicker's not working, so I may need your help with that. So what if Jesus was serious when he kind of elevated the teaching to the next level. Jesus didn't water down what were already somewhat difficult teachings, but often took those teachings directly to the next level. And so we began by looking last week, or the first week, or we began actually what we're going to say for this whole series, and go ahead and again help me out with the clicker, guys. Two forward now. One more. There we go. So we began by saying for, for this whole series, if we as disciples, if we trust Jesus, which we say we do, and I understand you may hear this, be here this morning, and, and you may be a guest with us, or you may be searching out whether or not you want to trust Jesus. And so if you don't, this, these teachings, I still, I still think have a lot of value for you. In fact, I know they have value for you. And so I want you to be searching this out. But for those of us who've said, I trust Jesus, I follow Jesus, I believe in Jesus. If we trust Jesus, here's the question for us. Are we going to listen to him even when his teachings are difficult or seem to turn our world upside down or seem to, teach the, seem to turn the teachings of the world upside down, the instructions of the world upside down, the wisdom of the world upside down? And somebody said to me a few weeks ago, and I think this is spot on, the reality is that what Jesus is actually doing is he's turning the world right side up, right? So the world is telling us one thing. But Jesus tells us another thing, not, not to turn your world upside down, but actually to turn the world right side up. And so if we trust Jesus, will we listen to him even when his teachings are difficult, even when we don't understand, even when it doesn't seem practical, will we still choose to listen to Jesus? And so we began last week by saying this, or the first week, go ahead guys to the next one. By asking this question, because Jesus taught us to love in a very radical way. In fact, Jesus said, I want you to love in such a way that, that you, you don't allow yourself to, to be or stay angry with another brother or sister. Don't allow yourself to linger there because that anger can turn into a rage and a bitterness and a hatred for that person. And that's a lot like murdering someone, Jesus said. Whoa, right? But what if Jesus was serious when he asked each other, when he asked us to love each other in a truly radical way, one that had no room for anger that is like that, like bitterness and malice and rage. And then last week, as we were looking at uh, these passages, the, the next passage that we looked at, where, where Jesus talks about this idea of, of lust, right? And he says, if you even lust after someone in your heart, it's like you've committed adultery with them. And we're like, whoa, wait a minute, Jesus, what are you, what are you saying here? Because the reality is, is that most of us haven't committed murder, right? But, but many of us have been angry with somebody. And maybe we haven't broken our marital vows physically, but Jesus says, look, if you lust after someone, it's, it's like doing that. And so out of that, we had to conclude this, that Jesus just, he just takes sin more seriously than most of us do. We also had to conclude that Jesus takes commitment more seriously than most of us do, right? I mean, it's just kind of true. Jesus takes commitments the marriage commitment even. He takes these commitments more seriously than most of us do. And then beyond that, Jesus was willing to go further to avoid sin and keep his commitments than I often am. And that's a hard thing to swallow and a hard thing to accept because as we read through these passages in the Sermon on the Mount, and we see Jesus almost raising the bar, raising the standard, sometimes we see how, fall, how far short we really truly do fall. I mean, Jesus was willing to go to the ends of the earth to avoid sin and keep his commitments. Am I? We also said last week, and this is kind of the why behind this, that, that Jesus knew that the state of my heart can create a barrier that limits my ability to see God. 
And so why does Jesus up the bar and say, look, I don't want you to have anger in your heart. I don't want you to have lust in your heart. It's because Jesus knows the truth about me and about you that the state of our hearts can create a barrier that keeps us from seeing God. We just sang that song, blessed are the pure in heart. And there are times when my heart is not pure. For one day they shall see God as the promise. And I think the truth is we can see God right now, but oftentimes we have a barrier and that barrier is our sin. It's the impurity of our heart. And so Jesus knew that the state of my heart can create a barrier that limits my ability to see God. And Jesus doesn't want that to be true for any of us. Jesus wants you to be able to know God, to see God now in this moment, and then to spend eternity with him where you will see him face to face every day. And so we know this is true, that, that Jesus knows this about us, because we said, as we went and looked in 1 Samuel 16, 7, that people judge by the outward appearance. And that's kind of the whole problem of what Jesus is addressing, is that you and I put a lot of stock in the outward, but God is looking at the inward. And that's going to be true for today's message as well. We say, well, I didn't kill anybody, but God was looking at the heart. God was looking at the heart, and he knew that we were angry, maybe angry enough to kill somebody. Or God knew the state of our lustful hearts. God knew. And he knew that the state of our hearts was creating a barrier, and so he said, listen, Jesus said, even your heart matters in this. Not just what you do, but where your heart is matters. I want to begin with a story this week as we get ready to dive into this week's text. This is, one, this is going to be one that, that most of us are probably familiar with. A shepherd boy tended his master's sheep near a dark forest not far from the village. Soon he found life in the pasture very dull. All he could do to amuse himself was to talk to his dog or play on his shepherd's pipe. One day, as he sat watching the sheep, and the, for, and the quiet forest, and thinking what he would do if he were to see a wolf, he thought of a plan that he found somewhat amusing. His master had told him to call for help should the wolf attack the flock, and the villagers would drive it away. So now, though he had not seen anything that looked even like a wolf, he ran toward the village, shouting at the top of his voice, Wolf! Wolf! And as he expected, the villagers who heard the cry dropped what they were doing and ran with great excitement to the pasture. But when they got there, they found the boy doubled up with laughter at the trick that he had played upon them. A few days later, the shepherd boy again shouted, Wolf! Wolf! And so again, the villagers ran to him to help him only to be laughed at. Then one evening, evening, as the sun was setting behind the forest and the shadows were creeping out over the pasture, a wolf really did spring from the underbush and fall upon the sheep. In terror, the boy ran toward the village shouting, Wolf! Wolf! But though the villagers heard the cry, they did not run to him as they had before. He won't fool us again, they said. So the wolf killed a great many of the boy's sheep and then quietly slipped away into the forest. And the moral of this story is, liars are not believed even when they speak the truth. You know, this morning, Jesus is going to deal with us on something that we don't really disagree with him about. I mean, we, we don't, in principle anyway. We don't disagree. In fact, we have stories like this one from Aesop's fables, and there are many other stories that you can find about the importance of telling the truth, where the moral of the story is tell the truth. Or if you lie, you're not going to be believed. And we know this is true. And in fact, we, we talk about societally that the basis of society, of a healthy society, is trust. If you and I can trust each other, 
When we speak, we can know uh, I trust that person. They're telling the truth. And we want for others to tell us the truth. We want there to be a, a, a system by which we can trust each other and believe that when you speak, I know that you're not trying to deceive me. So I think for the most part, at least in principle, we're going to agree with Jesus this morning. It's not going to be as much of a leap as the last ones have been. But in reality, we're going to see that in practice, we still often fall short of what Jesus is calling us to. So if you've got your Bibles, I want, you to, I want to invite you to open up to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start here, and we'll move on as we go as well. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus begins the same way that he has spoken some of these, others, uh, these other passages. He says, again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oaths, your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. Okay, so again, again, you've heard. This is what you've heard. You've heard it said to the people long ago, to your ancestors. Now, this is kind of a, a summary of several commandments, but do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows that you have made. But Jesus says, I'm going to take this a step further with you. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. So we're going to dive into this in just a little bit more depth in, in, in a minute. By, we're going to jump ahead to a passage out of Matthew 23 that will shed a little bit more light on this. But before we do that, let's just deal with what Jesus is saying to his disciples and to the crowd that we're listening as well. Jesus says, listen, you've heard it said. In fact, it was said. Moses even said it. Look, if you swear an oath, you keep that oath. Don't break the oath. Don't break the oath. So what is Jesus doing? And Bruce touched on this a little bit in his communion thoughts. What is Jesus doing now when he says, listen, you've heard it said this, and it was actually Moses who said that to the people, and there were a number of commandments that led the people to, to be able to swear an oath so that they would keep that vow or to make a vow. And so Jesus says, you've heard it said, keep your vows, keep your oaths. But as Jesus looked out across this crowd of people, he saw a whole bunch of people that may have been following somewhat the letter of the law, but were completely missing the spirit of the law. Again, remember, Jesus sees beyond what people do to what's going on inside of them. And listen, they were so different from you and me, right? They were super evil, right? And we're super good. So we don't ever do anything like this, right? We don't ever do anything like this. You may not be able to see what I'm doing, but I'm crossing my fingers behind my back. Because I'm going to tell you one thing, and we did this as kids all the time. If I had my fingers crossed, I could tell you whatever I wanted to tell you, but did I have to do it? No, because I could come back later and say, well, guess what? I had my fingers crossed, and they were behind my back, and you didn't see it, so you didn't know what I was doing, but I knew, and I fooled you. I got you. And Jesus is dealing with a whole bunch of adults, his disciples included, who were crossing their fingers behind their backs when they were telling people, I'm going to do that. Here's the truth. I, I swear by the Lord and his throne and by heaven and by the earth, and I swear by all of these different things, I'll keep the truth. Just kidding. Just kidding. And so Jesus says, listen, folks. I know what's going on in here too. The words that are coming out of your mouth, boy, they sound good. I swear, I promise, I'll keep this vow. But what you're thinking in here and what you do later are very different from what you promised over here. And so Jesus says to those people, listen, we're going back to square one. It's like kindergarten of keeping the truth, of telling the truth, 
of keeping your promise. We're going back to kindergarten on this one. You got two things you can say, yes or no. And anything beyond that, anytime you try to twist that or anytime you try to rationalize that or anytime you try to pull this number, right, fingers behind my back, and they're crossed, Anytime you do something like that, let me tell you where that comes from. That's not God in you. That's not good in you. Yes and no are from God. Twisting yes and no are from the evil one. And Jesus looks out at a bunch of people and says, stop it. This isn't good. It's not good for your hearts and it's not good for your relationships with other people. I don't want you to do this anymore. Now, we're going to try to dig into this a little bit further and understand where this was coming from in Jesus' day. You're probably familiar with a group of folks called the Pharisees. The Pharisees were a group of religious leading rulers in Jesus' time, and they often came up with a lot of different laws and rules to expand upon the rules, the laws that Moses had been given to the people that God had given Moses. And the Pharisees made loads of ways to come up with ways that you could either keep or break these rules. And they did it as well with making vows and oaths and promises. And most of the people, most of the Jews at that time, listened to what the Pharisees said. They were very influential. So if the Pharisees said, listen, here's the kind of work you can't do on the Sabbath day, and here's the kind of work you can do, which, by the way, they'd come up with a whole, whole list of things you could do but couldn't do. Well, then the people said, okay, we got to listen to what the Pharisees say. And if the Pharisees did that with keeping vows and oaths as well, then the people said, well, I guess that makes sense. So that's what we'll do. So in Matthew chapter 23, Jesus actually addresses this. Now, I want you to see the way he addresses the Pharisees and what he says to them. He begins with these words, woe to you. Now, this is not the woe that means they did a really cool thing, right? Like, whoa, that's awesome. This is the woe like, hey, this is really bad. And bad things are coming to you because of this bad thing. So woe to you, blind guides. And we we have a saying, we use this every now and then, right? It's like the blind leading the blind. Where did this come from? Well, this came from Jesus, who looked at the Pharisees and said, listen, you all, who are Israel's religious leaders. You're like blind guides. You have no clue where you're going. I've had a guide, a tour guide, on on several different, you know, phases in life, different things, different activities. And one of them I can remember that I, I enjoy doing every now and then, going whitewater rafting. And thank God none of those guides has ever been blind because it would have led to disaster, right? Have you ever been whitewater rafting? I mean, those guys are constantly watching, seeing what they're doing, making sure that you don't get caught in the wrong place, that you don't go right over the top of a lumpy rapid, that you don't get stuck on the backside of one, which is called a hydraulic, and those things can all be bad. And what if, what if you got on a boat? I mean, what if you went whitewater rafting sometime this week, you jumped on the boat and you realized your guide was blind? Would you find another boat? Maybe. Because, you know, it's not a good place for for a blind person, right, to be out there guiding others. Now, Jesus says, look, we're talking about medically, metaphorically blind people here. And so Jesus says, you Pharisees are like blind guides. Let me give you an example, Jesus said. He says, you say, if anyone swears by the temple, the temple, it means nothing. Ah, but if you swear by the gold of the temple, then you're bound by that oath. All right? Tracking with me so far? This all makes sense, right? So you you can swear by the temple, you don't have to keep that promise. But if you swear by the gold, you better keep that promise. Jesus actually says, no, you blind fools. He says also, if anyone swears by the altar, ah, there, it means nothing. Right? You You just... You swore an oath by the altar. It doesn't mean anything. No big deal. But anybody who swears by the gift on the altar, the sacrifice, now we're talking. Now you're going to have to keep that oath. Because you didn't swear just by the altar. You also swore by the gift on the altar. So now you're bound 
by that one. You blind men, Jesus says, which is greater, the gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred? Jesus goes on to say, therefore, if any, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and by everything on it, and anyone who swears by the temple swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. Anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. Now, this is, this is kind of a confusing passage, right, to some degree? It's kind of a confusing passage. So I'm going to take just a, just a minute to try to explain it to you, right? And here's the truth about this passage. It's, it's complicated, right? This, this passage is kind of complicated. It is. It's complicated. All right, here's the truth about this passage. If you're looking at this and you're saying that doesn't make any sense, that's the correct answer. Because it doesn't make any sense. What the Pharisees were doing didn't make any sense at all. The kind of rationalization that they were engaged in didn't make any sense at all. Listen, you can swear by the temple, but don't swear by the gold. You can swear by the altar, but don't swear by the gift on the altar. And the Pharisees might have looked at that and they might have said, look, it's, it's complicated. You, you guys don't understand. It's complicated. But if you're just a regular person like you and me, and you're looking at that saying, fellas, that doesn't make any sense. You're with Jesus. It doesn't make any sense. Jesus was calling the people to stick to the simple truth. And instead of trying to wiggle out or create wiggle room in a promise they were making, he was calling them to stick to the simple truth. Now, I want you to think about this, because um, certainly I think this is a problem that Jesus was addressing. Now, certainly he was addressing the individual problem, but imagine that individual problem expounded upon, well, 500 times maybe in this room. Or imagine it in, in a city expounded upon 50,000 times or 100,000 times or 1 million times. Or imagine in a nation this size with roughly 340 million people. Imagine the problem that Jesus was addressing individually times 340 million. So let me just ask you a question. What if we lived in a society in which no one was expected to tell the truth ever? I mean, what, what would that be like? I mean, what if you knew that in, in every statement someone made to you, in every representation of the truth that someone made to you, there was room, well, there's wiggle room. Every time somebody made you a promise, there was wiggle room. Every time somebody made you a promise, they could have their fingers behind their backs. We, we don't do this as adults anymore, right? This whole finger behind the back thing. But if we're honest with each other and ourselves, a lot of the same kind of rationalization that we did as we were kids when we put our fingers behind our backs or that the Pharisees in Jesus' day were doing when they said, listen, if you only swear by the altar, it's all good. It's okay. Or, or if you only swear by the temple, it's okay. You don't have to keep that promise. What, what if we lived in a society in which nobody was ever expected to, to tell the truth? And what if we lived in a world where it was virtually impossible to trust anyone because of the fact that you can never know if somebody was telling you the truth? What if? I mean, what would that be like? I mean, just, just ponder that for a second. If you could never know, or if it was even beyond that, if it was virtually impossible to trust somebody, think about this little phrase that became real popular in the last, I don't know, four or five years, right? This phrase, fake news, and it was thrown all over the place by everybody, no matter what side you're on. 
If you're on this side, what the other side is saying is what? Say it with me. Fake news. But if you're on the other side, what's this side saying? Same thing, fake news. It's fake news either way, right? And what are we really saying? You can't trust it. You cannot trust what the other side is saying. So if it's a media outlet and they're on the other side, what are they doing all the time? Well, they're lying. You can't trust them. But what if you're over here? And what if you're looking at the media outlets on that side? Well, then they're always lying. Wait a minute. So are they always lying, both of them? Is there no truth out there? Is there no way of finding the truth? And you know what's wild about this? I've actually had people say to me, we just can't know the truth anymore. Probably a little more than a year ago, I remember posting on Facebook because I, my, my, my mind was blown by just all the things that were shared that were not verified or would come out just, you know, like a few days later after somebody shared it on their timeline, we'd find out that wasn't true and that wasn't true either and that wasn't true either. And so I just, I just wanted to appeal to the Christians and say, Christians, it's important that you and I can be seen as honest brokers, period. It's important for, 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 the, for us, it's important that, that you and I, when we speak, that we're not sharing the latest garbage, but that when we speak, at least we've, we tried to verify that, that what we're saying is true. And so I put out there and I was amazed by how many people came back and said something along these lines of, look, you can't know what the truth is, so it doesn't matter. Wait a minute. So if, if I can't find something out, I'm going to go ahead and share it anyway because we can't know what the truth is, so it doesn't matter. Well, maybe the right thing to do is to say, if I don't know if it's true or not, I'm not going to say it no matter what. Even if maybe it's true. Even if maybe it's true, I'm not going to share it until I know it's true. Because my yes needs to be yes and my no needs to be no. And so we don't know whether we can trust people on this side of the aisle, as far as the media is concerned, or on this side of the aisle. We don't know if there's a middle anymore. And the same is true with our politicians. I mean, we've been saying it for generations now. You can't trust the politicians, right? You just can't trust the politicians. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and it's probably true. But if you're over here, guess which politicians you do trust? The ones that are over here with you. But if you're over here, you know you trust the politicians that are over here with you, but those guys are liars. I mean, what if we lived in a world where you just never knew if you could trust everybody? Because we know this, right? It seems like everyone has an agenda. I mean, everybody has an agenda. Those guys over there have an agenda. Those guys over here have an agenda. We just can't trust anybody. All you're concerned about is your agenda. You're not even concerned about the truth anymore. The agenda is more important than the truth. You see why Jesus' words make a whole lot of sense. Not just for you and me individually, yes, because that's where it starts. I've got to take responsibility for my words and the things I say or don't say. I, I do. And you've got to take responsibility for words, for the words you say and the words you don't say. I, we've got to take responsibility for that. Because when we don't, we start to live in a world where I mean, you just don't know whether or not you can trust somebody. And instead of the default being, I don't know, Apostle Paul said something about love always trusts. Our default is, I can't trust anybody. And so where do I start? I don't trust you until I can tell that I can trust you. That's kind of the world we're living in. But let me tell you what. Through listening to Jesus... Through understanding Jesus' message, the Apostle Paul cast a very different vision in Ephesians chapter 4 for those who would follow Jesus. Shared these words first with the Ephesian church, and lots of others read them in the first century, and we read them now, roughly 2,000 years later. This is what he says. This is the very different vision that Jesus, and then by proxy, the Apostle Paul has for the community of faith, for the disciples of Jesus. He says this, 
you were taught with regard to your former way of living to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its, important word here, deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now listen to what Paul has to say about this. He says, since that's true, right? Christians, your old self, we put it off so that we can embrace this new life, a new way of living. So because that's true, the apostle Paul says, here as a result, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and do what? Speak truthfully to your neighbor. And he's speaking specifically about inside of the church, but this is true everywhere we go. Paul's conclusion, this is important in the church because we're all members of one body. So what if we couldn't even trust each other inside of the church is what the Apostle Paul is saying. Now we got to speak truthfully, put off falsehood, speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. So we're going to return to, uh, to one of the questions that I asked. Actually, I'm, I'm going to give you two questions because I know there are probably some, some objections, and, and, and I know there's, there's always tension when it comes to this idea of speaking the truth. And what's wild, I, I, did, a, you know, I did a search this whole week. I, I searched and, and Googled and, and, and would see, you know, are there exceptions to when you should tell the truth, should not tell the truth? And there's a lot of different opinions about this. But two questions that kept coming up were these, okay? So the first question, and this may be an objection that you had, is this one. But what if speaking the truth will be hurtful to me? You ever been there? You know, I, I can remember as a kid <clears throat> breaking something that was my parents, something, a gift that had been given to them. It was, it was a vase and, you know, it was, it was, you know, a beautiful vase. And so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to do here? I can accept the blame. I can find a way to put it off on my younger brother who's too clueless to, he'll just say, yeah, I did it. I mean, he was four years younger than I was, so that was kind of an easy one, right? He did it. He, he looked at it wrong, and, and it fell off, and that's what happened here. I can make up another story and just say I have no idea how that happened. I can find the super glue and go at it like a jigsaw puzzle. I mean, there's a whole bunch of options here, and only one of them is being truthful. And that, that's just a small example, right? I mean, this happens to us today as well driving down the road, and you get pulled over. I mean, we talked about the speeding thing last week, right? But it's an easy one to come back to because we all struggle with it to some degree. Driving down the road, you get pulled over. Do you know how fast you were going? I do, but I don't. <laughs> no, <clears throat> I have no idea what was going on, officer. You tell me. Right? I mean, we're, we're real tempted to say, look, when it's hurtful to me, Maybe then I have an out. Or at least that's where the Weasley part of us feels like we have an out. Now listen, I don't want to use this next idea out of, out of context, but I think there is a principle here. When Jesus in John 8 talks about the truth setting us free, he's talking about the ultimate truth. I mean, he's talking about that truth. That Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's talking about the ultimate truth, that when we obey him, when we follow him, when we give our lives to him, we're going to come across the ultimate truth, which he's, by the way, the ultimate truth. And in that, we will be set free. But I think there's a principle here for each smaller truth along the way also, is that ultimately the truth sets us free. I mean, again, we know this is true because we've got loads of stories about how when we tell a lie, we end up like the boy who cried wolf. Or even little sayings like, oh, what a wicked web we weave when first we endeavor to deceive. Because it becomes a web. Because to cover this lie, you've got to tell another lie and to tell another lie and another lie and another lie. And the next thing you know, you're in bondage to those lies. And so... Is Jesus right when he says the truth will set us free? 
Well, with the ultimate truth, he's 100% right. But I think every little truth, because truth belongs to God, every little truth along the way, Jesus is right about as well. Then we got the second question, but what if speaking the truth will be hurtful to someone else? I know this can happen, right? I mean, I I know this is a, a possibility. How do I look in these clothes? Awesome. (laughs) You look wonderful. Fantastic. That dress link makes you look 27 years younger. Right? I mean, look, there's another scriptural principle. This one comes from Ephesians that we're we're to speak the truth in love. And sometimes it's not easy to speak the truth. And sometimes we have to be really careful about how we speak the truth. And sometimes we have to determine which truths are worth speaking in the moment. You ever met somebody that's just like a a never-ending faucet of truth and you're like, okay, I've had enough. I don't need any more truth right now in this moment. Or opinion sometimes, right? I just don't need any more of it in this moment. And so we have to be wise in the way we communicate truth. And the Apostle Paul's instruction is to speak the truth in love. And so I think, yeah, there's sometimes where the truth is going to be harmful to us, but ultimately, or telling the truth may be momentarily harmful for us, but ultimately speaking the truth sets us free. There are times where, yes, speaking the truth might be hurtful to someone else, but we still, as Christ followers, endeavor to speak the truth, and especially the ultimate truth, in love. Let me tell you, one of the hardest things for me to be truthful about is when someone looks at me and says, so you're telling me according to the way you think and your beliefs that if I, if I live my life without Jesus and I do whatever I want, that, that I'm going to spend an eternity in hell? And I want to water that one down because, boy, that's not easy to, to say, especially in our current climate, right? The kind of climate of political correctness. You can't tell somebody that kind of thing. That's offensive. It's... Yes, that's what I believe. But I'd love to talk to you about the plan that God has for your life and for you to just hear me out on that. And know that even if you choose against that, I'm still going to love you. And I hope through loving you and speaking the truth and love to you over and over again, maybe you'll be convinced that there really is a better way. All right, so we asked this question earlier. What if we lived in a world where it was virtually impossible to trust anyone? As we wrap up this message, I actually want to flip that question. And here's what I want to flip it to. What if we lived in a world where one group of people could be trusted to tell the truth, even if no one else could? I mean, what if that was true about Christ followers? I mean, that would be unbelievable. It would be like light in darkness. Somebody really smart said that once, like, I don't know, like 30 verses earlier, right? Jesus said, listen, I want you to be light among the darkness. What if we lived in a world where one one group of people could be trusted to tell the truth, even if no one else could? I'm not telling you this is going to be easy, but what if? So here's my challenge to you this week. Because I know I'm going to struggle with it. I know you're going to struggle with it as well. There are going to be times where you're going to be tempted to tell something that is, uh, you know, maybe a watered-down version of the truth because you're trying to deceive somebody or not give them the whole truth or whatever it is. When those opportunities come, will you trust God to give you the strength to tell the truth, even if it's going to be hurtful to you maybe? Even if it might be hurtful to someone else, will you find a way to speak the truth in love so that you can still speak truth without being hurtful? Will we be that group of people that can be trusted, even if maybe no one else can? Will we be that group of people? Let's pray. God, I know that uh, you've got this vision for living in such a radical way that truly does seem to turn the world upside down. Jesus, I know that your hope is to actually turn the world back right side up again, and you want that to start with us, with your people. It's my prayer this morning 
for every individual in this room, but us as a collective body as well, that we would be a people of truth, a people who can be trusted, especially when we point people to you, Jesus. This is my prayer in your name. And the church said, amen. Let's stand as we sing.